You hear me? Oops. Good morning, everyone. Can you hear me now? Yes. Welcome to our conference on maritime archaeology. Um, thank you all for coming. Thanks to the speakers who have come from near and um, far to participate in this event. Um, uh, one of our goals in uh, conducting this conference is to have an open discussion debate around several of the issues and controversies that surround uh, the Bellatum cargo that uh, the Singapore government uh, owns and is now being exhibited at the Art Science Museum. Um, it was our goal from the start uh, to address issues head on. We know that there are problems, there have been controversies, the popular uh, press have picked up on certain issues worldwide and I think um, it's important that we set the context and also be open about, um, about some of the problems involved. And I hope that the discussion that will take place today, and it is meant to be a day of discussion, not simply of long papers. Uh, speakers, please uh, bear time limits uh, in mind. Um, uh, is to actually uh, uh, thrash out some of these, uh, some of these issues. And uh, the actual presentation of the exhibition at the Art Science Museum, which I hope you'll, uh, you have seen or will see uh, this weekend, makes an attempt to address some of the problems involved. The excavation of the Bellatum wreck, um, although extremely significant and, uh, uh, and important in uncovering uh, findings and discoveries, was not done perfectly. And we will hear some of that uh, this morning. Nonetheless, the discoveries were, uh, were uh, extremely important. The methods were sound. And at the end of the day, we have uh, a treasure of world importance. And I think this is something that bears uh, repeating. Um, archaeological treasures and discoveries belong not to single nations or even to regions. They're part of world patrimony. And as governments and uh, international organizations enact laws and policies, we should bear in mind that there is, in a sense, a greater goal for humanity as a whole, and that is the preservation and understanding of our past. Singapore's ownership of the Bellatum cargo, therefore, is important not because the cargo was discovered in Singapore waters, but because it tells a much larger and much more resonant story about the history of peoples. Now, that sounds quite grand, and I'll explain a little, a little bit in detail. We have, for example, um, a wreck that was found um, between East and West, as it were. Uh, uh, important uh, objects created in China for the Near Eastern market, a very early period of trade between East and West, uh, being carried on a boat built in the Arabian Gulf with probably woods from Africa or even uh, beyond. So we have already in the ninth century um, a, a network of trade and commerce and exchange that also brought peoples and ideas together. The actual objects discovered are fascinating, uh, a realm of, uh, uh, of uh, proto-porcelain, of early uh, ceramics produced in Tang, China, uh, but also interesting uh, um, other objects, uh, precious uh, uh, vessels of uh, silver and gold, a range of mirrors, um, objects connected with uh, writing and scholarship. Um, the whole story is amazingly interesting. And I urge you all, if you don't already um, own the catalog, uh, to purchase or read one you'll find contributions written by many uh, other people in the audience today exploring the various aspects of this, of this uh, remarkable uh, cargo. And I think the importance of this particular wreck has to be set quite aside from the problems of archaeology in general and uh, to this region in particular. Because this, the findings of this uh, cargo really uh, help us date uh, much of the material that we've uh, understood in, 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 um, in uh, excavations from other sources. It helps us see more completely um, uh, vessels that have uh, been known to us only in fragment. And in one remarkable example, we have a, 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 a fully preserved mirror that was only uh, described in, in the literature. So uh, I think the importance of the cargo, the importance of the discovery, 
is of great importance, and I have to say that Singapore is uh, very proud to be the owner of this. Um, my co-chair uh, for this event um, is Julian Raby, director of the Freer Sackler Gallery in Washington, and he's played a crucial role, um, not least because the Freer Sackler has been the uh, our curatorial uh, ranger of the exhibition and the publisher of the catalog. However, because of urgent matters, he has not been able to come today, and he wants me to communicate um, his regrets in this matter. He also has a few words that I'm going to uh, try to summarize for you because I think they're quite, um, they're quite important. Um, he believes, and I share this, uh, that the very fact that the exhibition has recently generated a certain amount of controversy should actually be, uh, be viewed as a positive aspect of the entire project because it is a means of, way of raising awareness and interest among the different constituencies involved in underwater cultural heritage. For Southeast Asia in particular, we hope that this might lead to uh, a reappraisal of our practices, both on the governmental level, but also on the, on the level of the practitioner, to establish perhaps new ethical guidelines, to provide new institutions and means of building capacity, and this is true not only for um, the countries of our region, but actually for Singapore itself, where archaeology is still a new and developing field. And I think we can all learn together in this way. Capacity building means a training. It means exchange of ideas. But at the end of the day, let's be honest, it also means money. And I think the governments of the region, or through mechanisms of private support, um, need to come up with uh, greater funding for archaeological endeavors. Um, and that will lead in the end, and you'll hear a great deal about this this afternoon, this will lead in the end to better preservation of important sites and hopefully the, um, uh, um, the lessening of, um, of incorrect uh, practices and, and looting. Um, so I hope this conference will be an important step in uh, developing uh, some of these understandings. Um, I, I'm going to conclude with just a couple of general questions that might help us frame our discussion. And the speakers, of course, will be able to drill down in greater detail about this and provide a, a, a better summary of some of these issues. Uh, first is the Bellatum Cargo itself and the exhibition. How can we best present this to the world? From my perspective as a museum person, I find that the historical discoveries of the Bellatum cargo are of such overwhelming importance that it deserves wide-scale dissemination. The first step, of course, is the catalog. The second is the actual exhibition here in Singapore. But I am a fervent believer that this is needs to be seen by the rest of the world, or at least other countries, and needs to be revealed in a greater manner. The web can help that, but of course we know that the encounter with real objects is of course extremely stirring, and it's heartening to see that our public so far, our audiences here in Singapore, have responded to the exhibition uh, very well. The second issue is how uh, government policies and international conventions can be tailored to meet the needs of our region the problems of developing countries, of, uh, of fishermen and other divers who uh, want to take advantage of these treasures, how can we best establish a policy that moves forward and protects these, uh, these sites uh, more effectively? Um, those are our, our main goals. Um, I'm going to conclude then with a, uh, with a reiteration of a statement about the public as a whole. And it is my uh, great belief that um, archaeology belongs, in fact, to everyone, not to a single profession or even to single governments. Um, it belongs to the community of scholars as a whole who approach and understand and interpret uh, material in different ways. Um, in a few weeks, actually in less than a week, uh, the Asian Civilizations Museum will open an exhibition of the Terracotta Warriors. Um, from Xi'an in China. Uh, uh, one of the most massive archaeological endeavors of our time, begun in 1974, uh, conducted, uh, I think, with great thoroughness and care, uh, a care uh, so careful, in a sense, that uh, the very tomb of the first emperor has been left untouched. And it is um, shocking sometimes to believe that the 
to realize that the great treasures that one sees in Xi'an, and hopefully uh, you will also see it here at the Asian Civilizations Museum, represent just a tiny fraction of the overall picture. Nonetheless, the, the Shanxi Provincial uh, Archaeological Bureau has made an attempt to share these treasures with the rest of the world. In the very beginning, uh, by uh, touring uh, copies of the treasures, uh, but of course in recent decades by touring select examples that were fit to travel that could reveal an important aspect of Chinese civilization to the rest of the world. And I think this is, uh, in a sense, a nice link and model for, uh, for uh, our own Belaton cargo and how this might be presented to wider audiences to develop an understanding of, uh, of a period where East-West ties were extremely strong, where international connections were, were, uh, were able to bring uh, peoples together um, in various uh, and fascinating ways. So those are my uh, particular um, uh, comments. Um, I apologize for their length. Um, with a little bit of business, the first three um, speakers this morning have, um, have agreed to change order. So um, uh, with a certain amount of apology to the audience, um, the first three speakers will, um, will uh, will move in a different way. In fact, exactly the opposite order that we see uh, on the program. We'll begin with John Mixick, and then uh, be followed by uh, Kwa Chong Guan, and then conclude the morning session before tea with, um, with uh, Mike Flecker. So let me first introduce uh, John Mixick, who's a great friend of archaeology in Singapore and a friend of the National Heritage Board um, in particular. Um, he has recently become uh, head of the archaeological unit of the Nalanda Shirajaya, uh, Shirajaya Center at the Institute of Southeast Asian uh, Studies here in, in Singapore. Um, his uh, uh, his uh, talk today will be on the archaeology uh, of ports in ancient Southeast Asia, the case of Palembang. Um, John. Okay, thanks very much, Alan, and it's great to see so many people turning up here on an early Saturday morning. And I'm always honored, especially when Professor and Mrs. Wang Gongwu show up for my talks. It always gives me an extra um, incentive to do better. I'm sorry for not being Mike Flecker, but I think they decided that Mike would be better as a climax than as the beginning of this morning. And um, what I'm going to talk anyway about here is the places from where ships start off and come in, rather than where the ships are themselves when they're under the water. Now, in Southeast Asia, land-based archaeology has been very well developed, especially over the last 30 years or so. It's been my privilege to watch the development of Southeast Asians as archaeologists over this last generation. But most of that work has been concentrated on land. Uh, very little work has actually been done under water for various reasons, a lot of them having to do with cost and uh, need for specialized expertise. Uh, most of my work has been kind of in between land and water. I've been working on ports ever since I first came to Sumatra in 1976, and um, those kinds of sites have a lot of the problems of working underwater with not many of the benefits. Uh, you have to work in areas which are still inundated part of the time, you're usually stuck in the mud, but you don't have the pleasure of being underwater and being able to swim freely either. So what I want to do here is kind of set the stage for the discussion of the underwater archaeology by talking about what we know of early maritime trade from the actual ports where this took place. Uh, by 2,500 years ago, the distribution of Dong Song drums all the way from North Vietnam, South China, through the mainland of Southeast Asia and all the way to Papua New Guinea indicates that there was already a fairly large sphere of uh, interaction and exchange in existence uh, before either India or China became uh, involved in this long distance maritime network. This was the period when the Malayo Polynesians were beginning to expand out into the Pacific. And um, slightly later than this, they expanded across the Indian Ocean as well, all the way to Madagascar. So these are the sites where no doubt there were concentrations of some kind of maritime trade, seaports, 
we're only now starting to actually find sites of seaports from this late prehistoric era. Very recent discoveries of some of these, especially in the Malay Peninsula, West Java. By the really historic period, this is the period when we begin to get some textual sources from places as far away as Alexandria, Egypt. The um, geography of Claudius is Ptolemaeus, living in Alexandria in the first, um, second century AD. The uh, Periplus of the uh, Northrian Sea, the Sailor's Guide to the Indian Ocean, around the same time. By 2,000 years ago, the Mediterranean was linked up all the way with China. And uh, these ports in Southeast Asia were mentioned in some of these Greek or Roman texts, places like Sabana or Sabara, according to different texts, somewhere in the Singapore area. Other places like uh, Okeo, South Vietnam, probably was also one of the sites known to the Greek or Romans, maybe as Katagara, and so on. So you see there is quite a concentration of these sites in the Straits of Malacca, Malay Peninsula area. By the 11th to 13th century, this is the period when Chinese began to infiltrate Southeast Asia as traders, as opposed to missionaries, ambassadors, and smugglers. There had been Chinese coming to Southeast Asia before this time, but we have almost no records except of the ones who got caught. So we don't have any actual descriptions of Chinese trade in the region until it comes to the 11th to 13th centuries, the Song Dynasty. The, the port sites, many of them have changed by this time. The ports in the Straits of Malacca keep shifting around. Um, there are very few sites which maintain their existence over long periods of time. But one of these, of course, was Palembang. Down here. So I'm not going to focus that much on Palembang except to mention some of the most recent findings there. Um, so, and then of course, if we come up to the 14th, 15th centuries, this is the Tomasic period. Once again, there's been a lot of shifting around of sites. Uh, many ports, as you can see, still in the same region, the south end of the Straits of Malacca. This is the big turning point. But um, the, the exact locations are not usually very stable. They can come and go, which is good for archaeology in a way because it means that you don't have too much disturbance in later periods at some sites obscuring what was before. So before 1000 AD, there's already a whole long list of ports of which we know something. Starting off with Kaosan Keo, running through the sites in the Malay Peninsula, Kuala Salinsing Perak, Pontian in Pahang. There's another one in Johor, which most people think, but there's that Pontian is also in Pahang. That's the oldest shipwreck site in Southeast Asia that we know of. It's been dated to about the third century, third or fourth, uh, but it's up a river. So again, is it maritime or is it riparian, as some people would have it? Uh, we have several sites in Kadah. We have sites in West Java. We have sites in Bali. We have sites in Sumatra. Uh, now these are the earliest Chinese artifacts so far discovered in Southeast Asia. They've recently been excavated in uh, South Thailand, a site called Khao San Keo, and uh, they are believed to date from the Western Han era. Doesn't mean there were Western Han people, obviously, coming to the Malay Peninsula that long ago, but that does mean that there were contacts between the sort of Siam Malay Peninsula, the Swiss of Kral region, and all the way up into what was Han Dynasty in northern China. And this is the same period, more or less, as the Dong Song drums were also being shipped around. So. There was already evidence of a fairly widespread network in which some objects from outside of Southeast Asia were beginning to circulate. Um, by the first, second centuries AD, we get these other sites again in the Sismus of Kra region, Kwanluk Pat, a very famous site there, with the very early Indian scripts, both Brahmi and Palawa, seals of various types, lots and lots of beads, including both Indian made beads of stone and glass and also Roman beads and uh, some of these other artifacts uh, with such things as um, um, this, tip, this touchstone in the lower right says this is the, belongs to the great goldsmith. So by the first, second centuries AD, there was a fair amount of trade going on with the Indian Ocean, all the way to the Persian Gulf and even um, over a little in, in uh, overland stretch to the Mediterranean. Then slightly later, during the Tang period, the Sri Vijaya period, we should say, in Southeast Asia, we get these various types of artifacts, uh, both 
Um, uh, this is a site, two more sites in the Isthmus of Kra region, Lampe and Kokokao. And here we have one of these Chinese bowls of the type of the Balitong shipwreck over the kind of pseudo-Arabic script, but this is picked up on the beach in South Thailand. This is the period when the Arab sailors actually begin to chart to Southeast Asia. This is the period when already of the, Abba, the, uh, say the Arabian Nights, is, uh, the, or the stories in the Arabian Nights are set around this time, early 9th century. We begin to get Arab geographers saying the ships from Oman meet the ships from China in this place called Kala, which is probably the stretch of area between Kedah and South Thailand. We get this turquoise colored ware from probably the Persian Gulf region. We get the Arabic type glass ware. And we get to northern Chinese whiteware. Again, it's quite cosmopolitan. This is the period of Sinbad's famous seven voyages, uh, three of which went through Southeast Asia, based on kind of references in the stories. This is the beach at, at Lampu. You can see at the lower right here all the pits dug by looters on land. And this is where most of the uh, beads and uh, intact and taglios and other items have come from. And, uh, but the, at the upper right, you can see the, the amount of fragments of Tang Dynasty were just literally littering the shore. And no doubt under the waters just offshore, there's probably a lot more. There is one site there, Wat Pa Bon Tat, which is said to have been built during the Sri Vijaya era. And it's that grayish building there, which does show a fair amount of similarity with later types of structures built in Indonesia during the early classic period. Pontian, we had an exhibit to last 2009-2010 you know, on ceramics. And this is one of the sherds that came from the Pontian wreck. And it is of a type which is pretty close identified with South Vietnam. Uh, the ship itself was dated to be between late 3rd and uh, middle of the 5th century. Um, it had uh, uh, seen large jars probably for transporting rice in. So that may have been one of the functions of the ship. And we have a, f a couple other boats from this region in the South Thailand, first half of the first millennium, so pre Srivijaya. And then we have um, a couple from the Palembang area itself, one dated to the 7th or 8th centuries, and one dated earlier to the 5th to 7th centuries. So, but the, all these boats are on land, or they're in one land now. But they probably were in ports, they were probably abandoned, in uh, some kind of anchorage area when they were no longer functional. So ports are actually excellent places to look for remains of hulks of ships. Kuala Salinsing Pera, now um, we have a book, we had a conference here in Singapore about five years ago on ancient ports of Southeast Asia. And the proceedings of that are now in press with Spafa in Bangkok. Uh, one of the sites which was described there is this Kuala Salinsing site in Pera. Uh, that was uh, apparently stretched over the time, the late pre Sri Vijaya to Sri Vijaya. It's quite an interesting site, and a lot more research could be done there. But the area of which the most recent research has been done is in the South Kadah region, area of the Murabo, which is the big estuary here. Uh, the Murabo, and then on the south, we have the Muda River. This is the area along the Muda where a number of inscriptions of the 5th century have been discovered. And up here we have the sites of the later period, well, from probably 11th to 13th centuries, around the time of the Chola invasions. And that's where we get the Song Dynasty porcelain. Now this is one of the sites which is now being excavated by the Malaysian Archaeology Department. This is a site called Sumabatu, which has been known for a long time, uh, but only intensively excavated within the last couple of years. And so this is one of the large brick foundations that they have excavated there. Most of these foundations in the Sunai Batu area don't have Chinese ceramics associated with them. Um, they claim to have very early carbon dates, which I'm not going to quote because I'm not sure how secure they are. But let's say that these sites here may well date to the, the phase before even the foundation of Sri Vijaya in the 7th century. So they built a quite a large complex there. They're doing a very good job of exposing this to the public. And you can see all the very large scatters of bricks here. Um, there's a little um, display center there as well with the various kinds of bricks and so forth. And it's right next to a small stream, which may well have been uh, one of the routes of access into this region of South Kadah 1,500 years ago. 
about the time of these inscriptions. The, these Buddha Gupta, one is a Buddha Gupta inscription, so called, because it records the voyage of a sailor who called himself Buddha Gupta, written in this uh, early uh, Palawa script and using Sanskrit language. Uh, and then they also have very strong Buddhist connotations. Both of them have stupas on. So there was already a fair amount of literacy going on in uh, Kada in uh, the 5th, 6th century. This is one of the clay tablets also recently discovered there. Lots of little mantras, dharanis, and things. Um, still being deciphered. And uh, beads, again, large quantities of beads. This is what attracts the looters to a lot of the pre Srivijaya period port sites are the beads. Uh, we also have Tang Dynasty type wear, Changsha, Northern White Ware, Samara Ware, as it's sometimes called, a site called Sunai Mas. Sculpture, statuary, another feature of these early port sites seems to be a fairly large quantity of movable sculpture and uh, small temples, brick uh, structures, not very large kinds of uh, chandis like you get in the hinterland sites um, of mainland and uh, of places like Java. And it's usually a heterogeneous type of religion, both Hinduism and Buddhism together. Arab wares also from these early sites up until the 12th century seem to be relatively common. Well, lots of glassware in particular. And then this is the, now moving up toward the Bujang region, these uh, Song Dynasty wares as well. So there must be about 50 different sites in that South Kada area, all related in some way to maritime trade, not all of them ports, obviously. But which one was a port and which one was just another kind of habitation or religious or a bureaucratic site, we don't know for sure yet. Uh, these are some of the, this is the Bujang River itself. Again, highly silted up. Southeast Asia with its drowned coastline is ideal for creating lots of environments suitable for ports. Uh, and many of them are on estuaries, and so it's quite easy for um, people to find great, good areas in which to establish various kinds of uh, locations for meeting with uh, people coming in from the sea. There was an archaeological club at the old University of Malaya way back in the 50s, and they did some excavations here. This is a group from what was the University of Malaya, then became University of Singapore, now National University of Singapore. So the ancestors of NUS have been involved in Malaysian archaeology for a long time. This is one of the excavations in the early 60s at this Bujang site. Now, there are a couple, well, actually a fair number of boats also recently excavated in the Bujang region. And all of them seem to be of this last lug variety. They seem to be early Malayo Polynesian. But maybe Mike Flecker knows more than me of whether any of them are carbon dated. As far as I know, they haven't. So we have no idea how old these are. But at least they're sitting there, and they could be easily sampled. So this is the region of all these uh, nice estuaries down in the South Kada. So huge areas. Obviously, there were lots of um, trading villages at the same period. West Java, early first millennium, now recently discovered huge uh, brick foundations, probably for religious structures here. This is east of Jakarta. Um, gold items, uh, these little terracotta and uh, plaster stucco items. Again, these are probably pre-Srivijaya, 5th, 6th centuries. Lots of Buddhist activity, uh, these kinds of what is called Romano-Indian roulette pottery made in India probably in the first and second centuries, but imitating uh, Roman decoration. And then exported to Java, Bali. And besides Buddhism, we also have the Hindu sculptures as well, again indicating even probably imported these statues from South India. Sunbiran, so north coast of Bali, another area which is not considered usually as an important early trading port site, but along the coast there, the place called Sunbiran, we know that there was probably already trade going on with India. Um, there are, sculpt there are uh, burials there, one of which has been DNA, uh, DNA tested, and it seems to be Indian, of all things. So it seems like there was an Indian trader who actually passed away in Bali about 2,000 years ago, and more of this Romano-Indian related were as well, showing that several hundred years before Southeast Asia, before, say, Balinese became Hindu or Buddhist, they were already in quite close contact with South Asia. Karan Agung, the Ayurasugihan area, this is in South Sumatra. And this is another port site, which has only been recently discovered. It's in one of these transmigration areas. 
Uh, there are um, several different sites in a complex, along with gold items and so forth, again, dating from the pre-Chinese trade era. There's gold, there are Indian beads, no Chinese wares yet. But now we come to Palembang, which would be one of the most interesting sites, or should be, from the standpoint of historical sources, both uh, from...